<laughs> yes, so the live stream starts now. Hello and welcome to the second season of my digital talk series of on geopolitics and geoeconomics. My name is Velina Chakarova and I'm the director of the Austrian Institute for European and Security Policy based in Vienna, Austria. In the very first episode in 2021, I have the pleasure to welcome the historian and strategist Edward Lutwak, known for his works on grand strategy, on geoeconomics, military history and global affairs. He has been the author of numerous books, among which Coup d'etat, a practical handbook, the grand strategy of the Byzantine Empire, the virtual American Empire, war, fate and power, as well as the rise of China versus the logic of strategy. And as you can imagine, my first straightforward, uh, straightforward question to you, Mr. Lutwak, will be related to China. What, in your view as a strategist, has changed in the last 10 years since you've published the book uh, on the rise of China? And how do you actually evaluate the rise of China as of nowadays? Well, uh, the book you mentioned, The Rise of China and the Logical Strategy, was written just about 10 years ago. And it was a, a deterministic, deterministic, I put, I'm not, uh, I'm not a sinologist. It's true, I've been traveling in China for a very long time, since Mao was still alive. And it's true, I know many parts of China, and I know many, I have many friends in China, but I'm not a sinologist. I did not go through the discipline of studying 30, 40,000 characters to be able to read serious works in Chinese. So my approach was to observe China purely externally, just in what China is doing, not in what they're writing or what their scholars are discussing, but what they're doing, and then applied a deterministic approach, namely, because they did this, they must do that. And the entire book is full of straight predictions, saying that the Chinese will push against Japan, the Japanese will push back, and they will not stop. They will not stop. They will not say, look, we're ruining relations with a big country like Japan because we're quarreling over three uninhabited rocks. They will not stop, they will continue. In other words, my deterministic machine re reduced the Chinese to being like a cheap toy that you wind up, you wind up a little car and you send it against, and it goes only straight, it bumps into the wall, and when it bumps, it goes back and tries to bump again and so on. That was my approach. Uh, the Harvard University Press, had it reviewed, of course, because it's a university press, by real sinologists, real China experts, and they actually approved the book on the basis of the fact that I was very rigorous in the factual basis of it, and then simply projected. And also, they said that they could tell that I know China as a country, that I've been there many times, and I know many aspects of it. So they accepted the book. However, many people very reasonably, very reasonably said, how can you pre predict what the Chinese will do in such a mechanical way, such an inflexible way, implying that they learn nothing. And again, somebody said, like a remote controlled car in the hand of a child. And I said, no, not a remote controlled car. The little ones, the ones that are not remote controlled, the ones you wind up, and just go straight. And so anybody can now pick up the book and say if I was right or wrong. And why, and of course, I, I wasn't wrong, because like Wilhelmine Germany, before 1914, Germany had the world's best universities. It had the most advanced technology in chemicals, of course, and steel industry. 
and the electrical industry, only the Americans were competing somewhat. So they, and the Deutsche Bank was the world's largest bank. And German universities were so superior that if you were a student at Oxford and you wanted to study Latin and Greek, first you had to pass a German exam because all the works in Klassische Altertum Wissenschaft, you know, classics, were all redacted in Germany, the texts were German, and so So Germany had absolutely everything, but Kaiser Wilhelm believed that what he really needed was to build warships and compete with the Royal Navy. And that is how the British broke, ended their long 200-year quarrel with France and made an alliance, and then the Russians came in, and that is how Wilhelm in Germany destroyed itself because of uh, what you might call irrational impulse to power. Irrational impulse to power. Exactly what Nietzsche was afraid of, since Nietzsche, unlike other people, knew what war is. He was present at the first day of the first modern war in human history with, uh, you know, the new technology weapons. 38,000 Prussians died in one day in Gravelot. Nietzsche was there and he understood it, but almost nobody else did. So, on this, my, I used a mechanical, simplistic analogy with no flexibility, no allowance for, and so, and then, of course, the issue of Chinese strategy. The, one of the problems with China and one of the key reasons, key reasons why China was defeated and conquered by foreign invaders so that Chinese dynasties, one after the other, were foreign invaders from the steppe on horseback, entered China, conquered China, ruled it for centuries. The only exception was the Ming dynasty. Ming dynasty, 200 years. Because after that, it was the Manchu, Yurchen, who, and so on. The Chinese nationalist mythology is that the Manju became Chinese. They didn't. They were speaking in Yurchen language until the last day in 1912. And before then, of course, it was the Mongols and even Chinese historian nationalists don't pretend that they ever became Chinese. And they ruled for 200 years. And before then, there was another Yurchen dynasty. Why is that? Various reasons. But one reason is Chinese strategy. Chinese strategic concepts the famous Shunze are of great interest to everybody. They're very, very fun to read. And it's basically a long series of tricks. Tricks, not from Clausewitz, who talks about the, the iron logic of the strategy, who describes how the, the strong, very strong position on top of the mountain in the spits of the mountain looks strong, but actually it's very weak because it doesn't control anybody and so on. Clausewitz is analytical thinking. Shunze, Sun Tzu, whatever they call him, Sun Tzu, the, the Europeans call him, Shunze, the Chinese. This character is tricks. And when the Chinese arrive on the world stage themselves, they use tricks. Tricks, they bribe people. They make, you know, they double cross. They use cheap tricks. And with cheap tricks, you don't win wars. You don't win wars and you don't win strategic conflicts. And that is how the Chinese, you, you can visualize the scene. Uh, a few guys arrive from the steppe on horseback. They're met by Chinese army. Three Chinese generals exchange witty quotations from Shunze, you know, Shunze said this, Shunze said that, and these nomads who come from Manchuria who cannot read or write, overrun the Chinese army, defeat them, and rule China for 200 years. That is being Chinese history. And now, uh, in 1949, the American victory over Japan meant that the Chinese Whoever was the Chinese government, first it was Chiang Kai-shek, then the communist guy, would control the territory 
gifted to the Chinese people by the Manjus, by the foreign conquerors, because when they, they conquered China itself, they also conquered Tibet, and they conquered Xinjiang, and they conquered Mongolia. And all of these were, at, were the actual map of China, established not by any Chinese dynasty, but only by the foreign Manjus. And that is what, because of the American defeat of Japan, they inherited in 1945, was left to the Chinese government, the Chiang Kai-shek, and then the communists took over. So what we have here is people who live in a house that somebody else built. And these people think they understand what they're doing, but they are not. So since the book was published, at the time, India-China relations were wonderful. Wonderful. There was a little slogan about Hindi, Chin, bye-bye, friends, friends, and so on. Um, in Japan, there was very strong neutralist tendency. The people, the leading politician in Japan, Ozawa Ichiro, said that Japan should uh, disconnect itself from, um, from the United States and go with China. Um, at that time, the Australians were enthusiastic about their China relations. Canada was enthusiastic. Vancouver was becoming a Chinese city, partly Taiwanese, partly Hong Kong, but also mainland China. Um, you know, when they arrested Meng, the princess, the daughter of the, of the uh, Huawei boss, in Vancouver, she had to choose which of the two houses she would be for house arrest. Both of them are big mansions. So relations between China and India were wonderful. Relations with Japan were improving every day so that the Japan defense minister was in Beijing um, in 2010. And when I was precisely writing the book. Um, and that, and China was surrounded by friends, supporters, and so on. Today, of course, China and India fight, and people get killed in the Ladakh border, up in the Himalayan tundra, because the Chinese want another 100 square meters. They want another 200 square meters. They add it to Tibet, which they occupied and took over. Tibet, which had never been directly administered by any Chinese authority. Their, their relations with Japan are almost conflictual. The, the uh, Chinese Coast Guard and the Japanese Coast Guard meet in a hostile way every day, the Senkakus. Relations with Australia are completely ruined. Chinese, actually Chinese immigrants in Australia are under pressure because of the politics they are no longer acceptable. Chinese consulates may well be closed because of their interference. And in Canada, as you know, the Chinese way of dealing with the detention of Ms. Meng is to have two distinguished um, and very innocent uh, Canadians arrested as hostages. So my book said, I don't care what the politics is. I don't care that Ozawa in Tokyo is a neutralist. I don't care that Singh, Prime Minister Singh said that only a fool would fight over Ladakh. Or I ignore the politics. Why? Because strategy is stronger than politics. Strategy is stronger than politics. So when my book was published, every one of the countries that I said would turn against China and defend itself against China and combine together and start interacting and cooperating at that moment, all of them were friendly, and I wrote in my book that it's irrelevant because strategy is stronger than politics. Mm -hmm. um, I will pick on some of the, the statements that you that you that you made uh, during this first introductionary remarks, because you've been quite correct on uh, several um, predictions. One of which were um, that you actually claim China could either focus on diplomatic influence 
or on military power because military power would uh, certainly intimidate the regional neighbors which then would actually start coordinating and this is actually what you've also outlined uh, briefly uh, so my question to you is how will the united states coordinate these allies and partners that are obviously now quite well feel quite intimidated by china um and will the biden's administration manage actually to promote a kind of an approach to china what kind of an approach will be or how will this approach look like well at the present moment there is a japan australia defense industrial agreement which was made by the two countries on their own. There is a Japan-Vietnam defense industrial agreement. There is very strong intelligence exchange with India, and the Indian government, the Japanese government, is funding through overseas development assistance, highway building in India. Much of it concerns the border with China, the frontier areas in China, both in the West which is the Ladakh border, <clears throat> and in the east, Arunachal border, all of which are under pressure, in, and the border in between, which is the narrowest between ne where Nepal ends and before Bhutan begins, very narrow but very critical segment. So all these initiatives between the Japanese, Australians, and so on, the Vietnamese and Australians have developed a very strong intelligence exchange, which is very important for the Vietnamese because the Australians are part of the five country alliance and have access to electronic intelligence. So all of this happens spontaneously, organically, at the initiative of Vietnamese, Australians, Indians, Japanese. It happened not by direction from Washington. Washington did not direct. What Washington did were only two things. They were, when they were proposed that the United States should be part of this quad, the quad, Australia, Japan, India, the Americans were very happy to be, the, to join the quad and be part of the quad. The other part that the U.S. has done has been the U.S. Navy. The U.S. Navy holds exercises together with Indian Navy. The Indian Navy is very forthcoming. The Indian Navy is English speaking. The Indian Navy is international minded and much more efficient than any other part of the Indian state. Actually efficient at, in technologically and how they buy ships and so on. The Indian Navy uh, and the US Navy started training together and then the Australians joined in and the Japanese joined in. So this is a Navy alliance that was actually started an Indian initiative. It was the Indians who first proposed to do an exercise. It's called Malabar. And out of this grew a whole naval entente, which is developing organically. In other words, uh, in my book, I begged I sort of beg, please don't organize this alliance. Please don't try to create a NATO. Don't try to create a bureaucracy. Don't start having uh, meetings and second meetings and third meetings and structuring and organizing. Let it develop spontaneously. And that is, I would, now, there was a huge fight uh, in, that, in the Pentagon because I did it as a Pentagon study where the leading sinologist, who is a guy called Pillsbury, Mike Pillsbury, who is a serious person, who has spent years studying Chinese, as I've been too lazy to do. Mike Pillsbury begged the office not to distribute my study, which then became the book, because none of these countries would stand up. They would all surrender to China. They wouldn't resist. And certainly they wouldn't combine. So the Americans have to go there and form an alliance and tell everybody what to do and start 
providing, uh, you know, minute, more weapons for the Indians, and et cetera, et cetera. And so there was a big fight, and he begged them not to distribute my study, um, but they did, and he was wrong. The synologist was wrong. Why was he wrong? Because he was being reasonable. He was reasonable. He's a cultured person. He was reading all these cultured Chinese. He thinks the Chinese are cultured, and he thinks he makes a difference. Um, and he didn't realize that when Wilhelm in Germany was the most cultured country in the world, by far, the, the 12th or 15th or 17th German university was better than the best university in America. So culture doesn't protect you from strategic error. Mm -hmm. And we believe that since the Chinese are cultured and intelligence, they couldn't possibly behave like a little wind up car that bumps into the wall and keeps bumping. And that's exactly what strategy does to people. And there is another correct prediction of yours I would like to shortly uh, mention, and that is, of course, uh, the one related to the Communist Chinese Party and the one about the power of bureaucracy. Um, so you actually describe very well how bureaucracies uh, need, for instance, enemies so that they can actually justify funding. Now, finally, the PLA has this one major, not just one major enemy, actually, due to the systemic decoupling uh, initiated by the Trump's administration at the systemic level, but they can also point uh, the finger to uh, various regional rivals, as you've also described it and outlined it in your remarks, uh, so they can actually justify funding. And then again, this kind of top-down phenomenon that you've also described about the Communist Chinese Party, which is now even bigger and mightier. But then again, you also identified the problem with the ideology, which you described as being that. Are you still uh, sharing the same opinion about the Communist Chinese Party and the role of ideology? Uh, and do you think that actually ideology will be once again at the core of uh, systemic competition between uh, China and uh, the United States? Well, uh, let me say that I completely failed to predict Xi Jinping. I completely failed to predict, and I, I wasn't trying, of course, because again, I'm not a sinologist, but if you had interviewed me 10 years ago, and ask me how the leadership in China would evolve, I would have been 100% wrong. Because we saw that Hu Jintao's rule was primus inter pares. He was the first among equal. The prime minister did a lot of stuff. Other Politburo members took charge of many different important things. And there was an evolution from Mao, one man, Deng Xiaoping, one man, to more Jiang Zemin, more collective leadership, and Hu Jintao really expressed collective leadership. When the big earthquake took place in Shetswan, in the west, you know, west of Chengdu and so on, um, Hu Jintao didn't go because Wen Jiabao, his prime minister, went, and he was quite an authority, big authority figure, and so on. So I completely failed to predict that this will be a return to one-man rule by somebody who calls himself the core leader of China, who is every day claiming more Mao's rule, as if Mao was a big success. Now, moreover, Xi Jinping, if you had asked me, not generally, but specifically, about Xi Jinping himself, I would have said, if Xi Jinping comes to power, there must be a movement to liberalization. There has to be. In other words, I have watched, I've been traveling, as I told you, in China since Mao, and I've watched a huge liberalization from not everybody wearing blue, and women not allowed to have makeup, et cetera, et cetera, to a lot of different freedoms. When I was in China, there was nothing private at all, zero, nothing private. Um, there, and then we evolved. I've seen economic liberalization, social liberalization, 
cultural liberalization, uh, personal expression. I remember I happened to be in Beijing the very day that it was announced that homosexuality was no longer a crime against the state. That day, and I was walking down Beijing and I saw a couple of people waving, you know, in a particular way already and so on. So I watched China becoming more and more like Denmark. Then suddenly, boom, Xi Jinping arrives. And if you had told me, I would be the world's biggest fool if you had interviewed me about Xi Jinping, because I could predict that he would liberalize big. Why did I do that? Because Xi Jinping was educated. Unlike many Chinese leaders, he was went to the best school in Beijing. He lived in a Zhongdan High, where the leaders lived, his father being a very top second level, but very top person, a deputy of Zhou Enlai at one point. And he was a privileged boy, brought up by a the, the father. The mother was not very present uh, because she was like Epstein, an Epsteinian wife. Her, his father, she senior, at the age of 33, when he was already married and had three children, a pick married a 17-year-old. I think the official date of marriage, she was 18, but he was, you know, liked very young girls, and this very young girl didn't like him much. She did make three children, but left the family home to live at the Central Party School as soon as she could, etc. She couldn't commute, even though it's less than 10 kilometers, and so on. So Xi Jinping was brought up by his father. His father was the culture man of the, he was the propaganda chief, which meant he was the publisher of the party. He's the one who published the books and so on. And he went to the best school. Secondly, and uh, this Xi Jinping, uh, attitude to Maoism, I thought, would be extremely negative because when he was uh, 10 or 12 or whatever, his father was suddenly demoted and sent to become a low an employee in a factory in Liaoyang, which is quite a metropolis now, but which was a miserable place then. I happened to have visited. It was a really stinking, miserable, broken down place. And the old monuments there from the Tang Dynasty were completely neglected, of course. Today is quite a nice city, but that's where his father was sent. Then when the Cultural Revolution started in 1966, the father was brought back from the low-level job to Beijing, where he was paraded down the street, kicked and pushed and shoved, while his wife, Xi Jinping's mother, was walking alongside him, telling, oh, you dirty capitalist roader, you this, you that, and hitting him and so on. And then they put him in prison, where he stayed until nine, for 10, 12 years. He was... 16 years from the downfall till he was restored. During those 16 years, he was beaten, uh, beaten, humiliated, kept in prison for years, exiled, etc. His mother, of course, in because she was forced to do this on uh, or whatever it was, was declined physically. She's still alive as we speak. But her life was broken by Mao, like his father. He himself was thrown out of his elegant place. Red guards came in and ransacked the beautiful house in Chengdu High of top party leader. And he ends up at the age of 16, just turned 16, sent to a particularly horrible village in the hills of Shanxi State. Many foreigners visit Shanxi because that's where Xi'an is the famous uh, tomb warriors and so on. But the upper Xi'an, where he is, is a horrible, eroded, treeless landscape of particularly miserable land, low fertility, and a really horrible village and so on. And in this village, he only had one book, which is the, the Chinese translation by Guo Muruo of Dr. Faust of some Faust, Goethe's Faust, 
Faust, as you know, makes a pact with the devil that he will serve the devil, the devil will give him power. So Xi Jinping reads this book, he has no other book, he has nothing to do, he lives in a cave house, that is a house dug into the hill with no windows, and he has nothing to do, there's nothing to do in that village, it's a miserable place. So he reads Dr. Faust again and again and again, he knows it by heart. Now, this is the man who today, every day, is restoring the glory of Mao's party. Whatever, for example, when the big quarrel with Trump happened, he said, stop whatever you're doing and read Chairman Mao's lectures on protracted war, which are extremely long. They were given in Yan'an when they were taking refuge away. There was nothing, there was no nightlife there for all these communists and nothing to do. So Mao spoke nonstop for day after day after day. And he, so Xi Jinping is the man who is aggressively promoting not just the Communist Party, but Mao's Communist Party. By the way, his half-sister, which is a girl of his father, uh, not before, it was from his first wife, she actually committed suicide. Uh, another sister, the one who is alive and well, and a big billionaire with a, a $40 million villa in Hong Kong, she spent, I think, six years in a place in Inner Mongolia where she was very close to starvation and worked with other bad elements like her, daughters of you know, uh, chiefs that were removed, with her bare hands, to make to to work in the mud, digging ditches, for six or seven years, half starved. And so one sister killed, another is half starved. The mother is thoroughly humiliated. Um, she lived on uh, and still does today. And now the the Chinese authorities shamelessly shamelessly circulate the documentary of the mother and Xi Jinping, his wonderful childhood, how great she is. And this entire documentary doesn't mention nothing about her being pushed and shoved and kicked and beaten. She was beaten not once, but many times because she was take, the Red Guards would go, take her out, beat her up. And this went on for years, for years. So this, so I could never have predicted that mm -hmm. Dr. F would emerge in China, call himself Xi Jinping, and continue to serve the devil that ruined his father, ruined his mother, ruined his own childhood, and killed his half-sister, and tried to kill his other half-sister, who survived by miracle. So I would never have predicted Neither that you go from first among equals Hu Jintao, who consults, you know, the body language, he consults his other Politburo member, trusts his prime minister, relies on other people. And they themselves, by the way, um, were interacting with, with scholars, consultants in Beijing, listening to many people. When you go, I used to go to Beijing, I used to meet scholars, who are advising Politburo members. Today, nobody, Xi Jinping doesn't need advice. Thank you. There are no consultants, no advisors, only one who is another Faustian character, Wang Hunin. Wang Hunin, by far the most intelligent, the best educated Politburo member. Everybody said he could never be promoted to the standing committee because he's too intellectual and so on. Wang Hunin is the one with whom I had actual contact. There used to be a Tina. There was a, some young girl called Tina. He would email, I would email, and I would exchange. The moment he got promoted to the standing committee, that link was cut. And it wasn't much before, but there was something. Wang Hunin is an intellectual, he's a scholar, and he's a Faustian character because the, he is pushing 
uh, he did not have the terrible experiences that Xi Jinping did, had. Uh, his, Wang Kunin's father wasn't beaten, humiliated, kicked in the streets, sent to prison for years, uh, etc. But Wang Kunin knows the truth. So this is what we have, is Wang Kunin, the only advisor of Xi Jinping. Now, what does this Faustian character do in this plague year of 2020? He increases the repression of the Uyghur with the detention of, at any one time, one, two million people being detained in giant prisons, which are huge and have been photographed by satellite. He decides that in Tibet, the only way to end Tibetan culture is to take physically the Tibetan herders, the ones who work in the plateau with the yaks and everything, and train them to be industrial workers. The entire Tibetan tradition is about herding the yaks, the songs, the eating, the, the uh, special plates and bowls they make and so on. Take them out and teach them to be industrial workers and send them to work in Chinese factories, which is cultural destruction. Same as in Xinjiang with the Uyghur and Kazakhs, that they should no longer speak Uyghur or Kazakh, they should be brought up as children speaking Chinese. And in Mongolia, where nobody ever bothered the Mongols before, nobody. In fact, even during in the Red, during the worst of the Cultural Revolution, when the Red Guards were ruining life, uh, people, the famous the Xi Jinping sister who suffered hunger, cold, and some nevertheless survived. She was not in prison. She wasn't tortured. She wasn't mutilated. She didn't lose, didn't end up in a wheelchair like Dan Xiaoping's son because she took refuge in Mongolia. The Mongolia was kind of, had some freedom. Well, no more. Suddenly this year, 2020, they want to stop teaching Mongolian language in Mongolian schools. Order, mm -hmm. teaching a Mongolian. So, uh, or rather, to be more specific, no more teaching of subjects in Mongolia. It used to be that they had Mongolian teaching, plus they learned everything, history, mathematics, whatever, in Mongol. Now, only in Chinese. So, in other words, in the same year, he wants to suppress three nationalities, plus the Muslims in general, all Muslims, Hui as well, the Hui are the ethnic Chinese Muslim. In the same year, he, the, in the Gulf of Tonkin, the, the Chinese vessels, the uh, warships become much more aggressive. They sink a Vietnamese, quite a big Vietnamese fishing ship. It wasn't a boat. There were like 30 people aboard. In India, across the border for the first time in a long time, killing people with the Chinese troops under orders to kill them. They were not shooting, but they were armed with, with clubs, with uh, steel, steel tubes and so on. So he starts a new border war with India. He accept, uh, uh, increases there. In the Senkaku Islands, they do this crowding by sending ships in the Japanese Senkaku Islands. And he finds the break with Australia. The Chinese have issued 14 demands on the Australians. They stopped the Australian exports to China and 14 demands. One of the 14 demands is that the Australian press better be more respectful. Another of the 14 demands is that the Australian government stop funding strategic research on China. Now, they should just listen to what the Chinese tell them. Why do your own research? So, uh, with Australia, relations were perfect, perfect. I was in Melbourne once when hundreds of noisy Chinese spilled out of the casino laughing, joking, and the Australians who were there, they all said, well, you know, they're exuberant, they're happy. Who is to begrudge their happiness? Who is to challenge them? Today, if such a thing happened, uh, it's unimaginable. So in the same year, he ruins relations with Australia, with Canada, with India, with Vietnam, and of course, relations with the United States degenerate. Mm -hmm. 
So let's talk about the next uh, four or five years. Is the election of Joe Biden a good news for Xi Jinping and China in 2020? You also made this differentiation between the different branches in the US foreign and security policy already 10 years ago, pointing to the US Treasury's interests. That means, of course, business as usual, right? And also the Wall Street interests. But then again, Pentagon would be interested in having finally an enemy. That means more funding and more projects. Right. And then again, we have the State Department, which is playing a kind of a balancing role. So what would be your call for the next uh, four or five years? Uh, will we see more decoupling or more entanglement on the side of the America? And second question, related to the first question, uh, is about Russia. Because if there is one state actors that Xi Jinping really invested in, it was the relation with Russia. How do you see this relationship right. in the next four or five years? Well, I think, as you know well, and I think everybody who follows this would know, in the year uh, 2020, when Americans were quarreling violently about everything, there was only one point of agreement, the only one consensus. And that is that China has changed, and that China must be contained. The Xi Jinping's express theory is that Chinese communist rule in China will not be safe until there are no voices of freedom. They don't want to be, they want to, uh, they don't want to rule the world, but they definitely want the world to be quiet, not to speak about the Uyghur, not to do anything of the kind, not to support freedom in Hong Kong, not to defend Taiwan. Americans have understood that. In the year 2020, when everybody was quarreling left, right, Trump, anti-Trump, very strong and some, consensus on China. So therefore, expect continuity, China policy. The US Treasury is no longer influential because US Treasury had the generic influence when there was still solid grounds for hope that China would liberalize politically as well as economically, which it certainly did, and culturally, which it also did. Cultural liberalization, by the way, hasn't quite stopped even now. So the US Treasury was influential when there was hope. Now that there is no hope, the Treasury can only be pragmatically they say, well, this is a good deal, let's do it. And why not? Same for commerce. The Pentagon position is a very elementary one that now they have an enemy, now they want to uh, react to it. They, at this moment, their big goal is to build a big Navy, A, which is feasible. Two, that every ship should be so fantastically elaborate that it costs two or three or 10 billions, 13 billion, billion, which is not possible. Either they start, either they stop wanting so many ships, or they have to be more moderate in the ships they want. So what's happening in the United States is extremely linear, extremely easy to understand. And it's not going to be decisive. What's going to be decisive is whether the Indians learn the lesson of what happened in Ladakh and start doing basic things in India itself, like military reform. The Indian Army is 1.3, it's 1.3 million soldiers, which is more than the Chinese Army. They don't have enough money for it. And what they need to do is to reduce the Army and use the money to upgrade the Army more quality, less quantity, etc. Military reform, they need bureaucratic reform. They have to continue their road building, which has made big progress, but they need more than that. Because if you can't reach a territory, the Chinese will walk in that territory. This happened many times where the Indians cannot 
reach because they have no roads, the Chinese walk in from their very good roads on the other side. So the, the question in the United States, everything is going to be linear, continuity, development, and all the problems in terms of efficiency in the State Department, uh, efficiency in the Pentagon, and the intelligence problem, which will not be solved. The American Central Intelligence Agency doesn't believe in intelligence. They believe in bureaucracy. They believe in meetings. And they don't believe in taking and in, in recruiting the kind of people who can walk into a country, show up into a country, become a taxi driver, you know, get a job, live upstairs in some apartment, and actually develop feel and situational awareness, and eventually do other things. They don't do it because it's inconvenient, you see. They operate out of embassies, so we have a real failure of intelligence, which is systemic and continuous. We have very professional military forces, very professional. If you stop somebody uh, who has an MS-13 or MS-32, he's supposed to be, let's say, a tank gun fitter. He knows how to fit the tank. In State Department, our State Department, our diplomats, and I'm not talking about some great Italian is that if you call at 7 o'clock in the morning or 5 o'clock in the morning at a very small embassy and you get the duty officer, the duty officer will be serious will be there, will be very dynamic, and he will function. So we have a State Department that works, diplomacy that has had huge success, huge success, like keeping NATO together, NATO together, for all these years, dealing with the problems of the Luxembourg and Italy and Portugal and so Very good, and we have competent military, and we don't have competent intelligence. We don't. We just don't. The, it's a, the uh, secret bureaucracies can use secrecy to cover up ineffectiveness, failure, and incompetence. And in the CIA case, it begins with a simple fact: they don't speak languages. They don't speak languages. They there are there are CIA stations in countries where nobody in the station speaks the local language. And I, in one case, I said, how come you don't speak the local language? Not one of you. There has to be one person, at least, who speaks the language. They say, oh, this is not important. Everybody speaks Russian. So I said, yeah, well, as a matter of fact, I don't. But everybody speaks Russian. In other words, we have an incompetent intelligence, and this plays a role. Must be done. However, it's not so. Remember, the alliance has emerged organically. So what the Indians do, in a way, is very important, more important in some ways than what the Americans can do. What the Japanese have been doing is impressive. Even with the COVID, the new Prime Minister Suga immediately went to Vietnam, where they signed a very boring-sounding defense industrial type agreement, but which will open the door for Japanese military sales to Vietnam, and sales and transfers and gifts. Same with Australia. Same Prime Minister Suga, very new, already started. So the Japanese development as a more and more effective power, which helps to support other powers, helps to support Vietnam, collaborates with Australia, Australia collaborates with Vietnam, and all of them collaborate with India this is very important because it also provides a framework for the Philippines and to a degree Indonesia. Indonesia is defending its sea space, not just with words, but with helicopters equipped with anti-ship missiles. And the Indonesians have already sunk Chinese ships that entered Indonesian waters. So this process has, is continuing. And it is the case, very familiar case, of the Chinese themselves building an anti-China alliance. And the way they treated the way they treated the Indians in this episode is very 
educational. So as you know, Prime Minister Modi, quite rightly, decided that to respond to Ladakh, he would act in a different sphere, commercial sphere, by banning TikTok and other Chinese applications. Immediately, the Chinese press, the English language press targeted on India, Global Times and so on, said, oh, these miserable poor Indians boycott TikTok. This will cost pennies. This will have no impact on China. It'd be worth nothing. Well, within China, not everybody agrees. And the owner company, Tencent of TikTok, immediately went to the Shanghai Stock Exchange and said, we lost $7 billion of value. They were valuing the projection. The actual earnings are very small. <clears throat> the earnings are small, but India is plus billion, billion plus people. It's expanding at the rate of 200% per week. And so they, the Chinese government said, it's worth nothing what the Indians have done. Tencent replied. And in this whole interaction, you could see how the Indians were learning how to deal with the Chinese. Because if you, if you uh, uh, stop fighting on the border with a ceasefire, you stop with a ceasefire, that ceasefire becomes the starting line of the next forward creep. And mm -hmm. so they decided to open new fronts. And there are other new fronts to be opened. Uh, speaking of other fronts, uh, we uh, miss one puzzle. Uh, piece, which is the role of Europe. Um, the European Commission has just signed an investment deal with China, so obviously they want to make uh, business as usual with the Chinese, but then again they want to put themselves uh, loyal partners to the United States. Uh, they have been, for instance, Indo-Pacific strategies being published by Germany, by France, by Netherlands. Right. Uh, so, um, how do you see Europe's role in that big picture and specifically if the European, in the European If the European Parliament ratifies this investment agreement, if they ratify it, right, this will open a big crisis with the United States because the investment agreement is actually constructed from foam. The Yes, there's going to be investment. The Chinese guarantees on labor, like pretty labor rights, such as no forced labor, no forced labor, those are written in the agreement. Publicly, a Chinese professor came out yesterday and said, no possibility of implementation. He's a respected professor, Yi Xingong from the Fudan University, he said, impossible. In other words, the European negotiators negotiated an agreement where the Chinese side made promises that the European negotiators know are impossible and will not be fulfilled. Now, the entire European investment agreement is a German idea. And the Germans make wonderful cars, <clears throat> really good cars. They also make really bad strategy uh, and appears this for the Europe to turn against the United States. When Biden arrives and he sees the Europeans turning their backs because, of course, the Americans want restriction of investment and the Japanese government is paying Japanese companies to get out of China. Mm -hmm. And the Australians are doing everything to reduce interaction with China. Same Canada, same United States. And the Europeans say, oh, have an investment agreement. Chinese press said, oh, it's the end of isolation. I'm afraid that when the Germans are in charge, the music is very good. The cards are great. The strategy causes the destruction of the whole, you know, this is a most incompetent agreement from a strategic point of view. This, the Italian motivation of the foreign ministry, which is controlled by the Five Star Movement, is of course the Chinese presence in Italy, which is obtained 
there are a lot of smiles for the Chinese. The Chinese ambassador is invited to no meetings anywhere, but in Rome, he presides over meetings and these people show up. And the reason we know, because this is, the Chinese are behaving like very good tourists. They give big tips, big tips. And tips not only to waiters, but to politicians. So this is pathetic. One word about Russia. At this moment, as we speak, Chinese and Russians are broadcasting that they love each other. Putin <laughs> and Xi are not really kissing because of the COVID, they don't kiss, but you know the bombers are flying together, etc., doing all kinds of things. However, when I was in Vladivostok three years ago, the Navy University in Vladivostok showed me a map, a Chinese map, in which Vladivostok is China. Remember that the Russians are the ones sitting on territory taken from China in 1860. 1860, not a long time ago. And the Vladivostok people feel that China is the only threat to Russia. The only threat. That the Chinese want pieces of Russian territory. However, this is the reality level that if ever things decline and every we, situation becomes, we're, we, let's say America becomes weak, uh, Europe is absent, you know, and the Japanese are weaker, the Indians go become anarchical, something like that, the Russians will be forced to become the leaders of the anti-China coalition. It'll be exactly what happened in the First World War, where the Tsar wanted to be with the Kaiser, ended up fighting with the French, along for the French Republicans. And in World War II, Stalin made the deal with Hitler, wanted to be with Hitler, and ended up fighting for Winston Churchill. Stalin had a particular hatred for Churchill, ended up being, he had to fight for Churchill and the Americans. And so on. The same thing will happen again. If China becomes too strong, Russia becomes the leader of the anti-China coalition simply because their territory is directly threatened, um, which is not true of any other country. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, uh, maybe a related Europe. question. Sorry, pardon me. Uh, sorry for interrupting you. There is also a related question from uh, from the audience um, on Russia. Uh, do you think that Russia would uh, favor China or India in, uh, in in terms of an emerging conflict between the two Asian giants? Right. So look, the Chinese are good at everything except strategy. The Russians are good at nothing except strategy. That's why they have the world's biggest country. Nobody gave it to them. They got it by being strategically superior, not just in war, but in diplomacy and control and ruling these people. They don't rule their nationalities today, the Russians, the way the Chinese deal with Uyghur and Tibetans. The Russians know how to handle nationality. So the Russian attitude to China is expressed in these wonderful words that, that we are great friends now, the words published in the last 48 hours. There is another way to look at it, which is that the most important weapon supplier for India is Russia. Russia sends its best combat aircraft to India. Russia is the most important weapon supplier for Vietnam. So the only two countries in this world that are fighting the Chinese, actually fighting them, both happen to be armed by Russia. So Russia, may, Putin can say that he's in love with Xi Jinping, they're gonna get married. The fact is that the Indians get the weapons from Russia, uh, of course, from other countries too, the Vietnamese very largely from Russia, and the Russians supply them. So maybe that is the reality of their relationship, and not the kissing and hugging in public. Mm -hmm. And what is your outlook on a possible Russian-Turkey-Iran troika operating in Africa, in the Middle East? And how do you see the American approach? Uh, how would America and actually the American allies respond to this uh, 
you know, increasing presence and increasing coordination. The, the Iranian power capacity depends on recruiting and mobilizing Shia minorities in Shia populations in Lebanon, Shia populations in Iraq, and Shia populations potentially in other places. They are in Pakistan, where they are under attack and so on. Um, that is the scope of Iraq influence. When they have attempted to, to land in places like La Paz, Bolivia, and operate, it failed. In Argentina, it degenerated into a criminal terrorist enterprise. So the Iranians have the Shia thing. As for the Turks, the, the problem with, with Erdogan in Turkey is that people accuse him of being a Hitler. He's not. He's a Mussolini. You know, when suddenly he sent the big Turkish Navy to confront the Greeks, one French warship arrived in Eastern Mediterranean and the Turks shut up because the Turkish Navy people know that they have a bit of a cardboard Navy. You know, it's, it looks nice, you know, painted very well. The Greek ships are older and poorly painted. And the French ship they sent was a single ship. And they also sent two Rafale aircraft, two, using the sovereign base in Cyprus. The British sovereign base in Cyprus, two Rafale show up. There is a French-English agreement about that. And so somebody in Turkey made fun of the French because they sent two Rafales. Two, two. And the answer, of course, of the experts is that two is too much because one Rafale would sink the Turkish Navy. That's the reality level. Reality level is that Iran is very effective where there are Shia to mobilize and utilize. And Turkey is effective against people who have no capacity whatsoever. That is to say, Libya is anarchical, so the Turks come in and appear to them. In northern Syria, when uh, Assad regime left northern Syria completely abandoned, the Turks came in, they fought and they brought tanks against the guns of the Kurds, they made some progress, but they don't have actual true combat capability. And you'll notice that indirectly, because at one point, the Turks claimed that, that all the sea around Cyprus, most of it belongs to northern Cyprus, which is the non-country, which is basically the Turkish occupation zone in Cyprus, which has no rights legally to anything, of course, certainly not to the ocean. The moment they published this line, the Israelis noticed that it happened to be their offshore zone. So the Turks were going to send their warships there. And then somebody explained to poor Erdogan that the Israeli Air Force would sink the Turkish Navy in about 12 minutes. And that is how long that adventure would last. In other words, Turkey is with Erdogan talking at a volume much higher than its capacity. So people who build plans of what the Turks will do, they can do, and so is a failing. Moreover, as you know, the economy is very weak. There is chronic inflation. Appointing Erdogan appointed his son-in-law to be finance minister. He and his family did very well, I have to say. It was a good deal for them. But as you know, there is high inflation and high unemployment. Inflation is a problem very often. But it's very rare that you have high inflation and high unemployment. Because inflation means there's too much demand, too much demand. You know, price of milk is high because everybody has money. They're buying milk and they build it up. Well, in Turkey, they did it through great mismanagement, not due to somebody's stupidity, but to the complete destruction of a cadre of educated people, the Fethullah Gulen people were university educated. They have been thrown out of the bureaucracy and replaced with football fan Erdogan followers and assorted fanaticals. So there's been a collapse in the management capability of the Turkish state. The Gulen people were bureaucrats who were known to be honest because of their religious devotion. Gulen wanted to 
convert the whole world to Islam by good government, in effect. And it did work very well. For years, the Turkish economy grew and grew and grew under the control of these technocrats, Gulen technocrats. They've all been thrown out. And that's a very weak player. Turkey looks big in Germany, looks big in Austria because of the Turkish presence. Of course, many of the Turks in Austria and Germany are Alevi and have no use for Erdogan. Others are simply westernized. Others still are just educated liberal. But there is a bulk of the football crowd in this country, so it makes Turkey look big, but not in the international world. And this little episode with the two French Rafale fighter bombers sent to Cyprus and the back and forth that only two, what a joke, how weak France is, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. There are more questions coming from the audience, uh, but I know that uh, you have health issues, uh, so I don't want to. <laughs> I mean, it's I love you. Yes. Ah. I can I ask you this out, question. I was out, uh, in the cold, and yes. uh, oh my God, yes. I, I, if, I can ask you these you, questions, and you can decide whether you want to answer yeah. them so that right. I can yeah. I can address them. So there is one question on um, the influence of uh, the military dynamics uh, and uh, on, on the economic equilibrium, uh, specifically when it comes to the European, uh, to the United States global role. If United States is no longer the World Cup, what happens to the US dollar as a world reserve currency? There is a question about Pakistan, where does Pakistan fit into this uh, regional picture that you've uh, outlined. And then there is one question about uh, your personal recommendation for Europe. Can Europe uh, basically relearn strategy and how should Europe behave and navigate in this complex relationship between Washington and Beijing? Well, I'll, in reverse order, Europe, uh, the British and the French, however reduced their military power, are in Latin, capax belli. They're able to fight wars. The French president Hollande, the most unpopular president in French history, picks up the phone and French troops arrive in Mali within, I think, 24 hours. The British also have this ability to fight wars. They also have intelligence. The British have actual intelligence, uh, much smaller than the American, but much better in quality. Manpower. The French have some, the British have more. Both are states which are capable of war. Regrettably, unfortunately, and sadly, the only way Europe can be an effective strategic player is if, in spite of Brexit, in spite of Brexit, that ways are found for the Europeans to act as if they belong to one family. Uh, Europe used to be demographically, Europe was much bigger than Africa in the population. It was very huge, uh, important globally. Uh, only India and China were bigger in numbers than Europe. Today, Europe is shrinking and smaller. And if the Europeans combine, I'm afraid, however inconvenient it is, they have to follow British and French leadership. The Italians understand that because the Italians tend to follow the British uh, very much, not the French at all. But the problem is the Germans. The Germans have to recognize finally that their music is great and their cars are great. And for their strategy, they should just follow the French. If they don't do it, it will be very sad, uh, the outcome. On Pakistan, I'm going in reverse order. If you look back on it, Pakistan and India, in spite of terrible problems and inter interfaces and interactions and the whole huge Kashmir problem, in spite of that, both in India and in Pakistan, there's been mature conduct of relations. Pakistan's domestic situation has often been a mess. Democracy is unstable, whatever you want to say. But if you will notice that in Pakistan, India exchanges, 
there has never been nuclear threats. Both countries have nuclear weapons, and both countries are following the Israeli rule. The Israeli rule. The Israeli rule is some people say we have nuclear weapons. Maybe it's true, but we ignore them. You should ignore them. We will not push them in front of people and threaten them. The Pakistanis have never threatened the use of nuclear weapons. The Indians have never threatened it. The Indians and Pakistanis have knowledge of each other and a mature relationship. And as this alliance against China is formed, it is very unfortunate that Pakistan is aligned with China. It's understandable given the presence of India. But what the Pakistanis are doing strategically is highly rational. So it is not convenient that Pakistan is aligned with China, but this can be means that there is a huge bonus for India and for Pakistan to be able to resolve their strategic issues, however difficult, by exercising the same rationality and deep knowledge of each other they've shown. Because Pakistan being on China's side is a tactical necessity, but very damaging in the long run because it means that Pakistan is not with Japan, not with the United States, not with Europe, not with Australia, Canada, which are much better fit for Pakistan. Also, there's a big Pakistani diaspora in England, in Canada, in the United States. And the more Pakistan goes with China, the more this diaspora is cut off. So Pakistan is a big subject here. Now, on the first question, you'll have to repeat. What was the the, the first question relates to the role of the United States as the global cope, and so to say, the role of the U.S. dollar as the you know as the yeah. reserve currency of the world. Yeah. Do you the think US that there will be an impact yeah. now by COVID nineteen by the influence of this yeah. kind of dynamics that we are observing um, on shifting economic equilibrium? You have the way the dollar became a reserve currency was because of the fact that the Americans were exporting a lot and importing even more. So long as the Americans import more, dollars remain in the world. So the dollar works as a reserve currency. And so the issue with the dollar is whether the American financial system will continue to function the way it has. Remember, presidents come and go, Congress can do what it wants, but there is the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is the one that sets interest rates. Doesn't listen to the president. The president can talk and they, you know, try to have some impact, but the Federal Reserve is independent and it is because of the independence of the Federal Reserve, that the value of the dollar can be maintained because if inflation inflation starts, the Federal Reserve will crush it, will kill it with very high interest rates, with monetary restriction, quantitative measures, but in reverse. So the dollar, as the stability of the dollar, is guaranteed institutionally. Now, the importance of the dollar depends on whether the American economy continues to be successful globally. And you have to ask your question is whether, for example, uh, investors have sent money to New York to buy American, the shares traded in New York, or if they're sending them to the Shanghai Stock Exchange. So there's been the rise of China economically to a huge extent, but if you were an investor and you bought the Shanghai Stock Exchange, you would not have done very well, despite of the phenomenal success of individual companies like Alibaba. The fact is that if you look at the Chinese Shanghai index, it goes down. So, so long as the United States has the institution of the Federal Reserve, they're able to maintain the value of the dollar against inflation, which they will. 
That's their only, you know, they have the power to do it because currencies depend on only the Federal Reserve makes dollar bills so they can stop making dollars and only they set interest rates. And so long as investment flows to New York, then it will the dollar will also be maintained because people need dollars to buy a share in Tesla or in Google or whatever. If the vitality of the American economy declines, which is possible, of course, is part, I mean, for one thing, the educational reforms underway to cut standards, lower everything, uh, in the name of equality, stop reading books. If you, if you say, let's stop reading and writing so everybody will pass the exam, which is what's going on to some degree. So you, any, look, any country can be ruined, usually by its own inhabitants who want to achieve things that are perfectly nice, but happen to involve the ruination of a country. We have seen that again and again. The Americas as a continent uh, have only two examples of persistently successful states, Canada and the United States. And the new example of the last 30 years or so, Panama, for example, and so on. But mostly the other Americans are the Argentinians. And, you know, Brazil, which is by no means a ruined country. Brazil is a wonderful place, but that kind of politics is always possible. Always possible once you break the limits on old-fashioned, rigid, narrow-minded conservatism. In other words, it's true. The Swiss are nothing. Cuckoo clock. That's what the Swiss gave to the world, not Michelangelo. True. But if you're not willing to be as boring as the Swiss, you cannot have a strong economy. It's just a fact of life. So there's no guarantee from God that the American economy will continue in this position. However, there is the mechanism for it. The machinery is there. Well, we, I suppose, are about to find out how the economies will recover following the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and uh, there are definitely more questions. Uh, I propose that we think of another, of another uh, opportunity to address them because uh, they're just coming. <laughs> they're just coming Thank and uh, we Thank will need you. another hour. Yes, we will need another hour, and that's why I would like to extend my my, my warm gratitude uh, for for this um, warm up, so to say, um, for this um, conversation where we address so many issues. And I would like to invite uh, to invite already invite you to another session somewhere probably at the end of the year, so that we can also see where we stand. Uh, in terms of global power shifts, in terms of uh, China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative, in terms of the responses by regional rivals, but also by the United States and the European Union. And I wish you a very successful, prosperous and healthy 2021. I tend to say we live probably in the most exciting times in the last 2000 years. And I hope that uh, I will be you know, time will tell, of course, but I hope that I will be also proved, uh, proved uh, right on that matter. Thank you very much uh, for being with me. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.